firewood for $169.95. The amazing autumn project sales at TG O'Mahony's Arklow Ballymount Care, Gort Oranmore and TG O'Mahony's Plus Prosperous. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. All right, you're very welcome back. It is time now to review the Sunday Papers. This uh, afternoon I'm in the company of uh, freelance sports journalist Kieran O'Rahlick and uh, Cleon O'Connor, athlete development coach. Guys, thanks a million for coming in to join us. Thanks. It is one of those uh, one of those sporting days where a lot of the Sunday Papers is just kind of, it's a lot of reaction. Some weekends there are big governance stories. Some weekends there are a lot of nice fluffy feature pieces for us to delve over, but it is a hell of a lot of rugby and soccer in the papers today. Uh, before I run through the actual headlines as well, we are streaming live at the moment on all of our social platforms, on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube as well. Uh, you can also catch us on the GoLoud app or offtheball.com forward slash radio for OTB Sports Radio. To go through the uh, back pages, the headlines this morning, uh, the Sunday Times leader with a picture of Johnny Sexton celebrating uh, one of his tries yesterday. Sexton on song as seven try Ireland book place in last eight, but Aki sees red Red. Stormtroopers is the headline they go with, as Peter O'Reilly explains that um, the uh, the latest developments really from the World Cup, uh, as the time of going to press, as the Sunday Times say up there, no decision had been made on the game between uh, between um, Japan and Scotland, which, as we as we speak right now, is heading into the last minute, and Japan, we can safely say, are going through at top of that pool. They are going to be playing South Africa in the quarterfinals, and Ireland will go up against New Zealand because Japan still lead 28 points to 21. So unless Scotland can somehow score uh, 17 odd points or more than 14 points at least in the next 60 seconds, that is going to be the final score there. Uh, the Sunday Times or a Sunday Independent, I should say. They also lead with a picture of Johnny Sexton after the match, celebrating that win. Steep climb ahead. Schmidt's men at base camp, but facing into sheer ascent. Pretty much going along with the idea that uh, the tournament is really just starting for Ireland after uh, booking their place in the quarterfinals. Uh, next week, they will try go where they've never gone before and get beyond a quarterfinal place against New Zealand. Uh, and at the top of the page as well, McCarthy exasperated, but opportunity knocks in Geneva. As Dan McDonald says, Mick McCarthy caught an exasperated figure as he doubled down on his belief that Ireland had gained a point in Tbilisi rather than dropping two. Uh, I don't think that is the opinion of a lot of the uh, writers this afternoon in the papers, but we'll get to the reaction from Tbilisi as well. On the back page of the Mail on Sunday... Again, another, pic another picture of Johnny Sexton celebrating one of his tries. Two try hero Sexton pulls the strings as Joe Schmidt's men find their form to book quarterfinal spot, roaring into the last eight. Uh, and then at the bottom it says, Arling, gear up for Geneva after drab draw. Seamus Coleman has promised the Republic of Ireland will go for it against the Swiss in Geneva on Tuesday, where a win will guarantee qualification for the Euro 2020 finals. On the back page of the star... It is actually leading with uh, Gareth Southgate and uh, ahead of Bulgaria against England tomorrow evening. We're only human. Gareth backs his Lions uh, after uh, their disappointing defeat against the Czech Republic the other night, but at the top there as well. We are still in with a chance, and that is uh, hinting at both the rugby and uh, the soccer. Uh, as uh, it's, it's, it's explained there, Samoa boss Steve Jackson is pledging to help Bundiaki escape with the ban that would end his World Cup, while on the other side, Ireland boss Mick McCarthy refused to be downbeat after Ireland and were held to a goalless draw in Georgia yesterday. On the Sunday World, next, um, they lead with the soccer yesterday from Tbilisi, a picture of Aaron Connolly with his uh, head in his hands after one of those late chances for him uh, it went just wide. Switz in our hands, win in Geneva and we're home and hosed. Uh, Mick McCarthy defending his decision to restrict Galway wonder kid Aaron Connolly to a late cameo as destitute Ireland suffered a Euro 2020 setback in Georgia. And finally as well for the moment, we have the Sunday Mirror who lead with both the football and the rugby hit. Aki red card for high tackle takes shine off quarterfinal place as Schmidt pleads for leniency and miss McCarthy Rue's wasted chances as his boys in green see Euro 2020 hopes receive a setback. Now, before we actually get into the reaction from the rugby, which I think is what we're going to start with, just to bring you up to date, the IRFU have released a statement this morning. Uh, IRFU statement re false claims made by Sunday Times. So this statement came in from the IRFU this morning. Uh, the statement by Stephen Jones in today's edition of the Sunday Times referring to the Irish Rugby Football Union being vehemently opposed 
opposed to any rearrangement of the Scotland versus Japan Rugby World Cup fixture is completely false and the inference within the article that the IRFU made representations to World Rugby on the matter is totally without foundation. The Irish Rugby Football Union calls on Stephen Jones to immediately withdraw his scurrilous and untrue allegation. So that is a fairly robust uh, denial from uh, the Irish uh, IRFU that they were against any possible rearrangement of the Japan and Scotland fixture, which thankfully for everyone has gone ahead and the full-time whistle has now gone since uh, I started reading out the back page headlines. Japan 28, Scotland 21, Japan through to the World Cup quarterfinals for the first time. Scotland going home and Ireland taking on New Zealand next week in the World Cup quarterfinal. That is going to be next Saturday, uh, next Saturday morning just after 11 o'clock. So, guys, Kieran and Kleena, where are we going to start? The rugby? Can we start with Japan? Will we start with Japan? Just, just, just how great it is? Just fabulous, yeah. Mm. They're like Barbarians teams playing under pressure against big teams and beating them. And it's just, just watching. We didn't really want to be here. I wanted to be watching that match. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, that's fabulous. I mean, to, to pull that off, given that everything that's come on, the, the amount of pressure that's, that they've been under, a Scotland team that would have gone out with a lot of, you know, in their heads as well because they were being talked about being let down and allowed to leave the competition without playing that game. And yeah, there would have been a real chip on the shoulder from the Scots, back to the wall stuff, Gregor everyone's Townsend's out to get us. Yeah, Gregor Townsend wouldn't have been short of, of headlines to, um, to stick on the wall in that dressing room and to go out and score the tries the way they did. They just seemed to play with absolutely no pressure on their shoulders, which you're in that realm of development and athlete development and performance under pressure. I mean, the fact that they've been able to do that twice like they're not shocks in terms of performance. Results-wise, they might be considered shocks, but performance-wise, they're not shocks at all. Well, performance so far through the tournament has been fairly consistent. And, you know, people are saying, oh, Scotland wouldn't have been happy if the game didn't go ahead. But from what you, the sense you get from Japan, I don't think they would have been happy either. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's a home World Cup for them. They, want, they, they obviously want to play good quality rugby. They've obviously put in a lot of preparation into hitting a consistent high level performance for this tournament and y you often see the home team at these tournaments underperforming because there is that weight of expectation they've got more people there watching it etc mm. England um, four years ago for yes, example yeah. you know they seem to be coping with that and just playing really attacking free fast entertaining rugby and that's part of the reason I think why we all like them so much yeah, yeah. because it's yeah. entertaining as well oh yeah if they were just stumbling past Scotland yeah it'd yeah. be a very different thing but the style they play with, I mean, just looking at some of the stats here, like 550 metres, 76 carries over the gain line. I mean, what has Joe Schmidt done that in two years, maybe? <laughs> um, you know, defenders beating 33 in one game. The offloads are all over the place, like, and they're wonderful to watch. We were just reading a piece it's just there. the pace of the way they go about everything, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it's the pace and the confidence. Um, we're reading a piece there about, and again, this sometimes can, can sound great and not turn out to be great, but they had a netball coach from, South Af uh, from New Zealand involved for the last year and a half, and he's been working with them on their lower body, so because they're smaller, they have to be faster, they have to be more agile and he's working on their handling and changing direction you know footwork is obviously key but he's been working mostly on the props saying they can squash they're really fast but can we get them to turn around and pass and you see that in the first half there like how much of that play sm small close at hand passes and movement from the props even uh, not just Matsushima and the rest of the guys in the back but they've all looked incredibly comfortable I mean if, if Webb Ellis ever did pick up a ball and run with it he'd probably want to be playing like the Japanese team is this World Cup yeah, and I think it was probably badly needed for World Rugby this week as well, given everything that's gone on with the, you know, robust contingency plans has been the, the phrase we've heard all week. <laughs> and, you know, it really seems that they didn't really have much of a contingency plan. Um, but yeah, given well, the headlines well, over the last well. week, it probably was just badly needed. A nice good headline for them that the host nation have got through to the quarterfinal on merit rather than yeah. getting through by default and doing so in the style that they've done it. Well, also the fact there was quite a lot of deaths overnight in yeah. Japan as well. I mean, y you could see, I was thinking Scotland might come out and do this, but seeing the, the, the t both sides line up beforehand and the minute silence, I mean, it's easy. it's been easy to kind of forget that human element yeah. of things. Um, a lot of the times, if there is a natural disaster like that, it takes another week or two or so before the game can take place. And sport is great for bringing, you know, a nation together. But to have it the, the, the day, the very day afterwards, or even the same day for a lot of the country, uh, for them to go out and do that for the nation is, is fabulous in its own way. Yeah, anyway. and even on that as well, like there are a couple of pieces of, you know, journalists that are in Japan at the moment writing about the experiences they had over the last day or two in their various hotels and stuff. And you know, eyewitness accounts really of what this typhoon was like. There's one here in the uh, Mail on Sunday by Nick Simon, 
who was uh, reporting from his hotel in uh, Tokyo. Uh, the headline, I could feel my hotel moving and I was on the 62nd floor. And he's kind of going into details. You know, there was footage of roofs being stripped off houses, cars being flipped over, submerged vehicles, violent floods, trapped residents and reports of the first death 50 miles to the east of Chiba. Uh, in Sheba, a reminder that in the eye of the storm, there was more at risk than the integrity of the World Cup. Uh, he's saying there was a sign in his hotel which was meant to reassure guests, but one line stood out. Our hotel was designed to move during strong winds, so you may notice some related noise. Please do not be alarmed, as this is completely normal. It's one of those things that, like, it's trying to reassure you, yeah, but it is doing okay. the exact Your hotel opposite. Is supposed to move. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, th- I think we see that all the time with with big sporting events like you know there's um, with, with um, Olympics and all that there's always the human element around it mm. and around natural disasters and we're always stuck in the bubble of the sport and, mm-hmm. and the games and all that type of thing but any of these massive events always have a knock-on effect on the actual people that live there, mm. and it's. I think, it, and this is an example of when it's important to remember that. You know, yeah, there yeah. are you know, what the count now. Twenty-five it's been people. At least that, yeah. And I mean, millions have been moved out, and houses and other in the infrastructure destroyed. I think Fraser Brown, even one of the players, put up a video on on Instagram last night in his hallway in the creaking you could see it moving which must be very disconcerting but Japan of all places is built for that I think it's a lot of people have been piling on and to be honest I'm not sure you know if people are saying it, oh, why didn't you just move it you know one day here or there a, l- a lot of great events big events get cancelled entirely and we're talking about if we're talking about four games we're talking about four major events here you know 60,000 mm. it depends on which stadiums are some of them are smaller um but I think a lot of people are being wise after the event. I haven't, and I've, I was in Japan two years ago uh, with the Ireland team, and obviously that was a different time of the year, but we were talking about all the preparation and getting ready for it and why it'll be great. I don't remember, and I could be wrong, and I don't know if you two have seen it, but a lot of articles suggesting that there's a huge typhoon risk in October. Did you see any great deal of articles that were saying that a long time out? There's a lot of people now saying, you know, oh, this is partic- par- you know, perfectly inevitable. Yeah, I suppose, though, I'm sure a lot of people, it's not really something you're immediately thinking about. No, you know, it's, it's, it's when the, you, you see there is this big typhoon coming, and I think a lot of people since then have kind of looked into it and gone, well, actually, now that you look, a bit, now that you look at it, yeah. there, there was a fair likelihood that this could have happened. There was a likelihood, but it's, it's the biggest in 60 years, and I'm going to bring in uh, an article by Clive Woodward in the Mail as well, mm. and he says they do have a typhoon season in Japan, but more often than not it comes in July and August. Right, straight away, we can take that point if, if he's accurate. We're talking about the World Cup starts in September, um, and it's October now, uh, so that's a lot later. And he says the Japanese Grand Prix has been taking place in this autumn slot since '63 and not lost a race. Tokyo Olympics started 55 years ago this week and encountered no problems. So he says they've been very, very unlucky. There are questions, sorry, the Olympics is on there next year in July and August. So we have to wonder, you know, what, what, what's the thinking there mm. and how much this might impact what the IOC might come out of this and say. We, there are questions about um, contingencies. I think they have a contingency for the knockout stages, yeah. where they can move at 48 hours. But if you're talking about four pool matches in the space of 24 hours, I mean, I read somebody who's an expert in logistics who, who said, look, this is really impossible. So I don't know. I think, I think it's a lot more complicated than people saying, could you not just move it a day earlier? Yeah, but I think like a lot of the where the logistic kind of worries and the logistic complications come in is when you're talking about forty to 50,000 people, you know, coming to a stadium or something like that. If, if they had laid out, you know, if there is a danger of a typhoon and we are worrying about this, game becomes behind closed doors. I'm not an expert. It, it just feels to me that that would take a huge amount of logistical pressure out of the equation. Sure, sure. But I think some of the games they were talking about moving them and shipping them, you know, a couple of hundred miles away. And I mean, it's gotten to the stage where it's, it, this sounds almost cartoonish or maybe like one of those Japanese TV shows. Um, Woodward again says, would it have been possible to have a jumbo jet or even two planes lined up Thursday night or early Friday morning to fly Italy, New Zealand, Scotland, Japan, referees and TMO down to the southwest of the country that has largely escaped the, uh, the typhoon? I mean, that just sounds fantastical. I, I think we really yeah, need but somebody... Say, I mean, like England... England were able to find out their match was called off. They were able to hop on a plane and, and go down there and yeah. enjoy a couple of days of you know yeah, but they're, resting they're, up. But they're just going down on their own. They're not going to somewhere that needs all the TV crews, all the, mm. the, the emergency services. 
Yeah, there's like, a lot like, involved. It's probably will it come, will, first it comes down to priorities. You know, you're talking about playing the game behind closed doors. So, is your priority the spectacle of the sport or actually getting the game played? Mm. And obviously, in this scenario, the safety of 50, 60,000 people is going to be really important. If you can manage to play the game and not put those people at risk in terms of encouraging them to travel, that's yeah. that's a plus, obviously. But there is a it comes back to choice of venue as well for for any of these things. Um, if there is a significant chance that there's going to be big issues, whatever the logistical issues are, or if there's a significant chance that it's not going to be the right environment for athletes to perform at their best, we were talking about the marathon being run in the middle of the night mm. and stuff like that, yeah, yeah. then is it the right choice? So it's about, I suppose, the priority of are you trying to create the best space for athletes to perform or an occasion, a sporting occasion. Now, the best of both worlds is obviously... Ideal, ideal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can't have every tournament in London, you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, Woodward had a point there. I mean, that's something that hasn't been spotted too often. About you know, they've had the Olympics there. They're going to have it next year. Yeah. They've had those tournaments. They have Formula One. I mean, and the dates. You know, it looks like the the, uh, the Olympics are under more threat because that July and August is right in the middle of typhoon season. Yeah. So I think it is. You know, the worst typhoon in sixty years. I don't know how much contingency you really want. Well, I mean, like there was, I think it was Friday evening I saw a report, I think it was the Telegraph, were saying that one of the contingencies, for example, if Tokyo was unplayable, the game would be moved to Yokohama. Oh, it sounds ridiculous, yeah. yeah. There's, there's 14 miles away. between the two of them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when you see things like that, you, it does make you just kind of go, is that, is that enough of a yeah, contingency? Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to see somebody get in there and um, you know, get it an exclusive or a yeah. scoop on what the actual thinking was. I also think New Zealand have come out and said they, they weren't open to moving. So if they weren't open to moving, that has a knock-on effect that you couldn't have moved the yeah. other games. So that was a bit of a problem. I think the biggest problem now, we're lucky that this game's been played. Hugely. We're, we're blessed that the other two games weren't that important, but there's still a big asterisk around England and New Zealand not playing a week out. So having two weeks before their quarterfinals, New Zealand play us. I mean, Christ, do they need another week of, of, of not planning, <laughs> but of rest and recovery? I mean, that Joe Schmidt... You know, was nearly crying about missing one day before. What was it? Was it against Japan? It was we had a six-day tournament, yeah. day to eight. I mean, this is an extra week New Zealand have, and, and England, Australia, same thing. Check, I won't be happy. On the other hand, as well, though, I mean, like, look, hypothetical situation: if Ireland go out and beat New Zealand next week, are people going to be saying they were undercooked? New Zealand haven't <laughs> yeah. New Zealand haven't played a, a match of significance since the opening round of the tournament against South Africa. Yeah. Well, we're back in but confirmation that that's, yeah. that's part of being in a tournament like this where yeah. it's multiple games. You've got to be able to take the rest, take take whatever the context is. The best teams are able to deal with it, whether it's seven or eight or 14 days, the rest. Mm. All right, we do have to take a uh, quick break and get you your uh, news and weather as well. We'll be back with some more reaction to uh, the games in uh, Fukuoka and Tbilisi yesterday and a, little, a few more little bits as well besides. Off the ball. This is News Talk. Join that conversation on Facebook and Twitter. If you're close to retirement, you're probably deciding what to do with that extra bit of time you'll have. But you've another important decision to make, how to draw down your pension. So no matter who your pension is with, ask your financial broker or advisor about retirement planning with Irish Life, a smart way to make the most of what you have and fully embrace your retirement. We know Irish Life. We are Irish Life. Irish Life Assurance PLC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. And you are doing what? Ta-da! It's our new company sign. Thought I'd save the boss a few euros. What do you think? Looks like your 3D sign is a D minus. We can do a lot better. I'm calling Snap. Whoa, nice try, but let's take it to the next level. Build your brand with directional signage, vehicle and wall graphics, outdoor advertising or event displays. Wall to wall, bumper to bumper. We've got you covered. You say signage, design, display, digital, print. We say easy. Snap.ie whether it's a slice with sweet sticky marmalade as you rush out the door or a breakfast feast with crispy rashers and a gooey egg at lunch with smashed avocado or topped with chicken salad or a cheesy late night snack with a dollop of relish pop it and top it and make the mosty of that toasty with Johnston Mooney and O'Brien Johnston Mooney and O'Brien for your favourite fresh baked bread There's history in the baking 
Take comfort in fresh thinking. At Citroën, we've been driving mobility for over 100 years. Take comfort in style. Striving for performance and economy, but always looking good. Take comfort in choice. With more models and great features than ever before. And take comfort in comfort. Citroën's advanced comfort, so you can relax and enjoy the drive. Take comfort in the complete range of new Citroën cars and vans at your nearest Citroën dealer. Or find out more at citroen.ie. Citroën. Ever wondered what makes Flavin's Progress Oatlets taste so rich and creamy? Well, I've popped into this fine supermarket to tell these busy shoppers all about it. Now, Flavin's take only the finest locally grown oats and very simple. Attention simply, shoppers, the Flavin's Porridge Tasting is now starting in aisle five. That unique steaming process that really... Sorry, no, it's aisle six, aisle six. Tasty and healthy breakfast. Perfect for a winter's day like this. Any questions? Flavin's. Not your run-of-the-mill oats. Take time out with your family this weekend with the Sunday Independence 25 Best Autumn Walks. Featuring the best routes countrywide for all ages, from buggy-friendly tracks to adrenaline fueling climbs along woodland paths, coastal walks or mountain trails. Plus, we've got the best cafes and restaurants for you to relax at afterwards. In life, Andrea Cora talks exclusively about her deeply personal new memoir. And there's 10 euro or 50 euro for every reader at Dunn Stores. The Sunday Independent, the complete read. At the Plaza Group, winning national awards are always nice. Like the best motorway service station at the Barack Obama Plaza Money Gall and best forecourt facilities at the Galway Plaza. But ensuring you're a happy customer is the real prize for us. Quality fuel and forecourts, Supermax, Papa John's Pizza, Super Subs, Max Place Deli, Beauty's Coffee and Spar. The Plaza Group. Come for the fuel, stay for the food. Award winning and part of your community. Now open in Kinnegad, just two minutes from all Kinnegad exits. It's autumn, which means it's autumn project time. And at Teach Your Manny's, you'll get everything you need to get that autumn project done. Get floored with the deals in laminate, engineered and solid wood flooring. 10mm laminates from 12.95, 12mm from 18.40 per square metre and get your underlay free when you spend €150 Euro or more on these floors. See the next generation 5G engineered click flooring, all for only 49.75 per square metre. The amazing autumn project sales at TG O'Mani's Arklow, Ballymount Care, Gort, Oranmore and TG O'Mani's Plus Prosperous. Swap hibernation for a winter vacation with Aer Lingus. Get up to 30% off top destinations across Europe and the UK when you book by Monday the 14th of October. Soak up some sun in Malaga or Alicante or choose a city break to remember in Munich, Madrid or London. Don't snooze through the season. Wake up to winter. Smart bags are winter bargain. Smart flies, Aer Lingus. Book now at aerlingus.com. Offer subject to conditions and availability. Just transfer to stay informed. Know your workplace or business inside out, but in the dark about your financial investments, despite lightning flashes about recession. To get clued into your funds, pensions or portfolios, just transfer to Hobbs Financial Practice Limited. For advice on improved positioning, lowering risks and cutting costs, go online now to hobbsfinancial.ie. Just transfer to stay informed. Terms and conditions apply. Hubs Financial Practice Limited is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Across Ireland. Across Ireland. This is the Imro Radio Awards Station of the Year. This, this is News Talk. Good afternoon, I'm Adrian Harmon. The Minister for European Affairs says she doesn't believe the EU will compromise Ireland's red lines in the Brexit negotiations. Helen McEntee's comments come as talks between the UK and EU continue this weekend. They're hoping to reach a deal ahead of a key summit on Thursday. Speaking on On the Record here on News Talk, Minister McEntee says at this stage it's too soon to say what the outcome of the talks will be. I don't think there's a possibility that we would be landed with something that we don't want at the same time. That doesn't mean that we're going to have a deal by the end of this weekend. So I think we we need to allow them the time and space and not comment too much on what may or may not be coming out of them. A post-mortem is due to take place after a man's body was found in Cork overnight. Guardi have launched a murder investigation following the discovery at a park near the city centre. Stephen Burke reports. Guardi found the man lying unconscious at the park off Mardike Walk in Cork City after midnight last night. 
The victim had been badly injured and a fire was burning near where he was found. He was taken to hospital around 1am but has since died. Gardaí have opened a murder inquiry and a post-mortem is due to take place today. Investigators are appealing to people who are in the Mardike Walk area between midnight and 1am this morning to get in touch. A revolving door of temporary social workers at Tusla is failing children. That's according to the Fianna Fáil spokesperson on children and youth affairs, Anne Rabbit. Figures revealed to Deputy Rabbit show the number of agency staff hired by Tusla as social workers has increased by 125% since 2016, while the number directly employed only grew by 3.8% in that period. Anne Rabbit says children are losing out because of a recruitment and retention crisis in Tusla. This is a short-term solution which will have a long-term damage on the children and the agency. Children who are most vulnerable and in need of help, they need the permanency of support of a social worker. 19 people are dead and 16 are missing after the most powerful typhoon to hit Japan in 60 years pounded its capital Tokyo and surrounding areas. Up to 100 are injured while millions have been evacuated from their homes. One town was hit with 37 inches of rain in just 24 hours. That's all for now. More in an hour. News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA, you can find our lowest car insurance price online, guaranteed. Bright spells and showers today, some of those possibly thundery, highest temperatures of 13 or 14 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Off the ball. This is News Talk. You're very welcome back. We're here reviewing the Sunday papers in the company of uh, Kieran Rahalig and Cleana O'Connor. We have been speaking about, in the opening part of the Sunday paper review, Japan getting through to the World Cup quarter-final and I suppose the, the knock-on effect of what has been a really difficult week for uh, world rugby and the effects of uh, Typhoon Hijibus. But we'll get on to the actual coverage of Ireland's win against Samoa now from yesterday. And we're going to start, uh, guys, with uh, Neil Francis in the Sunday Independent, page two. Frustration once again as law puts players in danger of serious injury. Just to pick out a couple of lines, he's speaking about Bundyaki's red card yesterday and how much sympathy he has for Bundyaki. He says, once again, the unfeasibly late directive of the new laws regarding head-high tackles comes in six weeks before the tournament. The refereeing fraternity and their guarding committees have again shown that they have virtually no empathy with the game and its players. I suppose quickly, where do you stand on that? Well, can I just say his, his intro first, the, the first line is just classic. Uh, I've always spent that the ideal weight of any member of a rugby community, committee should be approximately three kilos. That includes, includes the urn. <laughs> Delightfully dark from Fano there. Um, yeah, well, I think he said there, I think he's got a perfect point about the, the lateness of this directive, that it's coming in so close to the tournament. But that shouldn't happen at any level. I mean... I know rugby loves to change new laws and implement new tests and what have you, but to have to have pulled it in that quickly and that closely, I mean, it's had a massive impact on the tournament. And I think um, when Conor O'Shea, who quite gracefully took the, the cancellation of his game against New Zealand, but he was rightly saying anything could happen in this game. They could have had a player sent off. Mm. And we saw what Australia did against New Zealand with 14 men um, in the Bledisloe Cup just a few weeks ago. Obviously, I don't think Italy would have won if New Zealand had 13 men. But still, the, the fact that the guard cards could and may yet have such a big impact. Um, the players don't seem to have gotten totally to, to, to grasp with it. I mean, I think I think a year ago, I mean, you could argue that's always been a red card and I don't think World Rugby has changed a huge amount in the laws. But, um, you know, the Aki one, I think it was just a fair, fair call. It was a fair yeah. red. But what Frano was saying here is that he should never have been sent off in the first place and that is why we can't help grumble about inconsistency. In the 27th minute of the game, Stander took the ball up to the Samoan line uh, and then the out-half Sutaini charged into Stander. His leading shoulder hit Stander square in the jaw. Nobody dipped. There were no mitigating circumstances. It was a clear-cut red card. In real time or in slow motion, it was very clear what had happened and Stander, who was able to take the hits, really felt that one and there was nothing given there. Yeah, I don't. Know. Did, did, did you see that one in the match? Not in real time. Yeah. I didn't know, but I went back and watched it. And I'm not sure. <laughs> you're you're undecided uh, over. To be is honest, it? there's a few of them. I mean, even the 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 um, Stockdale one. I mean, Frano here says the hit in Stockdale in the sixth minute was the worst of all the head tackles. It is true that Stockdale did dip prior to contact, but that hit could have done serious damage to the Ulster winger. Uh, and I mean, I think I do have a problem with uh, decisions being made purely on the outcome. You know, when a player falls high. And if they fall on their head, it's a red card. If they fall on their back, it's not. I think that's a ridiculous law. Mm. But in this one, I thought that was really dangerous. Um, I think ultimately they're trying to get every defensive player to go lower and lower. 
but some of them it just seems unlikely that you could. And Jack, I think it was Jack Lamb in the game said, "What else can we do?" And the ref said, "Take a lower." Yeah, like yeah, I think it's easy the, um, to say, but yeah, but that's part of it. It's it's like the you can't just continue it, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of all the evidence around the the concussion and the safety they had and all that. So there is an argument for it's too close to the World Cup to initiate a rule change that there isn't time for people to get used to it. But I think the essence of what they're trying to do is correct, and yeah. it is a new skill for players. I mean, it is how how do you tackle with with the force and power that you want in a more uh, specific manner. So it does take a while for people to get, get used to it. I don't, like, I don't think it's, um, it takes any of the physicality or anything or, or that out of rugby or changes that dynamic, but it is a new skill for sure. Yeah, and I, I, think it's, tackle better, yeah. I think it's more the actual just step-by-step -step framework is what was brought in quite close to the World Cup because like for the last year or 18 months they, yeah. they absolutely have been clamping down on yeah. you know tackles that hit the head and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, but the mitigating factor, that's probably yeah. the key thing, isn't it? Yeah, and what I thought was interesting yesterday, like we had uh, Johnny Murphy in studio with us and Keith Wood was on afterwards as well uh, for the match and you know they were both saying on the on the yellow card for, that Samoa had that they actually thought that was the yellow that was a yellow and Aki's was yeah, a red yeah, yeah. because yeah. of because of the way the Samoan player actually dipped into the tackle himself that uh, in the Samoan case that you know he had and actually Stockdale crouched did. down into quite a low tackling yeah. position which if Stockdale hadn't dropped down he would have just caught him pretty much right in the middle of the stomach yeah. whereas I think with Bundy Aki's one both players were kind of upright. Well, the Samoan player had just fallen down a little, but Aki was quite upright when he made the, the hit. He, he was, yeah. I mean, are we going to start gaming this now a little bit as well? You know, will the carrier drop a little bit? I mean, some of it just seems so minute. And, you know, everybody's saying Bundy didn't mean it. I don't think that ever matters really, you know, if you yeah. have a bad tackle in soccer yeah. and you're still up, intent doesn't count. Yeah. But um, it's going to take a while. I, I, I do think, yes, it do, uh, in a way I could argue bringing it in a week before the World Cup shouldn't be any worse because you're trying to get the right thing. Yeah. You know, the intent is there to make the game better. But I do think there's been quite a few instances where the TMO even has been brought in and they've talked it through and they didn't get the right decision. I mean, Samoa should have had a couple of red cards. Was it against Russia? Yeah, and I think the one, the opening weekend, it was the Australian-Fiji game oh, with yeah. um, Reese Hodge. Yeah, uh, sorry. His yeah. tackle on uh, Sammy Karevi, I think it was, or one of the one of the Fiji, or not, not on Sammy Karevi. His he had a red card against. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, mixed um, up in all these games now, exactly. Yeah. Well, there have been so many red cards. You know, uh, seven so far, I think, in the tournament by a mile, a record for the tournament as yeah. well. But yeah, well, that's that's an, uh, a story in itself, isn't yeah. it? I mean, that's indicative of the issues we're having here, and I think that's maybe what what Fran was talking about. I mean, in, in fairness, Neil Francis probably remembers Buck Shelford having. You know, losing three teeth, two concussions, and a testicle in one game, <laughs> yeah. and and looking at this game now and going, oh, lads, I'm not too sure about that. And and intent, I think a lot of people are still looking at intent and struggling with that. But if if it is to change the game and change the habits of everybody for a better sport, you're probably going to have to put up with the the pain. Yeah, I think it was uh, I think it was Eddie O'Sullivan on on off the ball at some stage. I think it was about a year ago when there were a couple of red cards coming in for these kind of tackles and. I remember him saying at the time, unfortunately, this is just something that we are going to have to put up with. Yeah. A, a lot of inconsistency. Yeah. We're going to have to put up with a lot of decisions that we think might be harsh. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, in a few years' time, we're going to be looking at the game and it's going to, pr we're, hopefully, it's hopefully going to be a lot safer. Yeah. And you kind of just have to put up with that frustration for a little while. You do, because the, it's a, a new structure, the, the mitigating factor, and then it's all based on that decision making. So someone has to make the final decision and until we have sort of benchmarks of what is and what isn't and we get used to it a little bit more, there will be inconsistency and mm -hmm. I think we just have to grin and bear it for a better outcome eventually, you know. Mm -hmm. Well it didn't affect Ireland too much yesterday so it's easier really to take, really? isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean if, if, uh, if Ardy Savea gets one next week it'll <laughs> certainly be interesting. New Zealand don't really get red cards though, do they? They don't. When did they get a... Against, against Australia. Yeah, against Australia. Yeah. And that was a huge talking point. The third time in history and or something like that? Sonny Bill Williams against the Lions was the only one before that for a number of years. Um, you mentioned how it didn't affect the performance too much. Is that where we'll go next? There were a couple of pieces um, kind of going through the performance. Shane Horgan was one actually who... <sighs> Shane's probably a little bit of an outlier because there's yeah. a lot of... Um, Willful optimism, I think. People are digging for optimism. There's a lot of people speaking well of Sexton, Connor Murray, Jordan Lammers, CJ Stander. But Shane just cuts through that, and I'd have to say I'd 
on balance agree with him. He says it's uh, the headline there is it's it's a struggle to see how this team can topple a joint. Um, in the case of this Ireland team up against the world champions or the Springboks, which it is obviously New Zealand next year next weekend, I'm struggling to identify that chink of opportunity. Um, he says yesterday's performance was better than the win over Russia, but good enough to beat New Zealand. I can't see it. And I mean, you know, on a on one-off game, you know, the cliche anybody can beat anybody. You, you could have a red card, which could make a massive difference mm. to that game. Um, but if you if you balance it all out, the probability for Ireland just doesn't look good. Even though yes, there was a, a great improvement. I think there is a lot to, to look in. Rory Best looked better than he had. Johnny Sexton definitely. I'm I'm, I'm surprised kind of to see him celebrating two tries against um, Samoa so strongly. But that maybe tells us something. Mm. No, because he does let himself. He shows his heart in his sleeve on the pitch sometimes. Sometimes for bad. But I think yesterday for good. Um, and I think Larmer played well. I think CJ Stander stepped up. Ty Byrne might. I don't know if, if Joe. You know. Will go to somebody like him for a. Quarter you get final. the feeling if it's New Zealand. Well, it, since it is New Zealand, I should say in a quarter final that you are edging back towards the more tried and trusted yeah, yeah. Omani, Rob Kearney if he's available again? Yeah, you'd have to, you'd have to think so and um, just, I, I brought up the ages in front of me here just to be sure about this but it's it's Rory Best's last games ever, game, games whatever, Johnny Sexton but he, He's going to play, he's got three more games doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Sexton is going to go full Tom Brady if he's going to be playing in France in four years yeah. Rob Kearney is almost certainly finishing this World Cup. Sean Cronin's the next oldest, Keith Earls, Keane Healy, uh, Conor Murray's 30, so you know he's a scrum half, yeah. he could have a few more years. But you've got a lot of players there for whom next Saturday could be the last game ever in an Ireland shirt. In At the a World, World Cup, Cup. yeah. Um, even a couple of them, you know, I don't know if they'll all continue on. Well, certainly, as we said, like, you know, Rory Best, he's finished after he's this. He's definitely there, gone, yeah. There could be a couple of test retirements as well afterwards. Yeah, as well, there could knows? be a couple other, even, you know, elsewhere, but... You know that, that's that's one thing to hope on. Mm -hmm. um, but in fairness, I, d I don't know how many of Ireland's big wins have been built on raw surge of optimism uh, of emotion. You know, we're generally. I think I think that's where Ireland actually gets their biggest wins. Would really? be my, would be my thinking. Yeah. Like I I don't know. I t I take Shane's point. You know what we saw the other day it isn't going to be the All Blacks, but of course it's not. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, that, that's it's sort of an obvious point because you're now into a quarter final, and yes, the team has been stuttering, stumbling a little bit through the group stages, um, but that doesn't mean they can't take a huge amount from that. And maybe because mm. they weren't happy with their first couple of performances, and then they go and they play Samoa, and what did we see? Just back to basics. There was nothing unbelievably great mm. about their performance but what do you do when you're in trouble as a team you go right let's nail the basic stuff and let's get that right and get that all boxed off yeah. and get through the game and that's something they haven't been doing they yeah. haven't yeah. they absolutely haven't been doing it so if you're looking at it over a tournament you're thinking okay well next game obviously massive so first thing you're not going to beat the all blacks unless you have all those basic things boxed off you know all the things that they're good at and then you're relying on that little bit piece of magic because it's Rory Best probably last game mm. and all that. So you're relying on all that to come out afterwards. But I think they had to return to basic, simple rugby and mm. try and get that right rather than going, oh, let's go out and produce something magical. Because if you go chasing that, you end midway up... To, midway a through a tournament probably isn't the ideal time to be going doing something like that, really, is it? To no. rip up the playbook and say, you know what, lads... Throw this thing around today. Let's see what happens. Yeah, yeah. definitely not. And I, there's a, Joe Smith said at some point as well. You know, we went back to what works for us. You know, and and of course they would because mm. right. Let's get back to what we as Ireland are good at, and get that right first, which I think is what we saw. But that basic performance won't beat the All Blacks. So yeah. to that point, Shane is correct. But. It's not surprising. There's one part in it um, that he says that I find curious enough because we were talking about how Johnny Sexton looks like he's quite sharp, the sharpest he's been for yeah, yeah. probably in the last 12 months or so. But um, Corgan says, good. yeah, I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't expect to see Joey Carberry in the starting lineup, and that pains me. When he came on yesterday, he oozed class. I love the way he avoids contact, not because he has a problem with collisions, but because he is so aware of space and its value. His grubber kick in for Andrew Conway's try was further evidence of his astute rugby brain. He doesn't specifically say that he would want Joey Carberry in ahead of Johnny Sexton, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's the way the, I'm thinking. I, that's I, the way I'm reading it. I think it's it's one of the the great regrets. And again, this is nothing against Rob Kearney because he's he's constantly delivered. But um, looking at what other countries have done, if we could have gotten 
Joey in there at mm. some time. Now again, obviously his injuries haven't helped him. He got injured in the very first game against Italy. Maybe he would have played against England or uh, either the games against Wales. He could have played at fullback. Could have played at ten. Um, to have seen him get on at t- at fifteen would have changed that Ireland team completely. I mean, Larmer's showed a lot of what he has. He's grown into the role. He's gotten more confident. He looked brilliant yesterday mm. and linked up with Sexton for that try. Was what you want from Larmer, um, and that's something that. Rob wouldn't give us either, so that's a you know reason to think Glamour could do something there. But if you had Joey, I think a lot of coaches would just get Joey on the pitch, you know, they'd, like like Leinster did, um, putting uh, Johnny at ten, Joey at fifteen. He's just got so much magic, and that try was just the same as he did against Gloucester. I mean, with Munster, he linked, yeah. linked up. He's looking for it, you know, and not many other Irish players are looking for that kind of thing. And I, I think the last paragraph of Horgan there was good. Um, because you know we are talking about we're at this stage we're at the quarter final and we, none of the problems we had before, none of the issues like yeah. who's gone home Jack Conan, you know we had a couple of injuries beforehand but but uh, Horgan says I fear however that uh, he being Joey will kim- come to symbolise Ireland's missed plight of this World Cup the injuries that kept him out of the early games and the cautious approach that was refused to countenance even trying to play him in Sexton in the starting fifteen. And you know that might be you, you can you can lose in a, in a World Cup quarter final in a million different ways, but there's been a few things that haven't gone well in this tournament, and I think it will be the little kind of incidences that we're talking about rather than the big catastrophe against Argentina last year. If things don't go don't go right next next week, mm-hmm. on the same page on the Sunday Times pages two and three, there Stuart Barnes is. Um, He's hammering home the Irish optimism, really. Uh, not even the All Blacks will want to face this giant green monster. The headline is probably a lot more kinder than the contents of it because he's not really saying we're this outstanding rugby team who could play the All Blacks off the pitch. Know, he's, but a, he's a great line there. A, a, a giant green monster capable of sucking the very air out of a game of rugby. Which is a compliment of sorts, I'm taking it as. Um, why any neutral would want this percentage rugby to prevail over the panache of the defending champions is a mystery other than everyone else's chances will rise if New Zealand lose. So, you know, he's pretty much saying everyone's really going to want Ireland to beat New Zealand next week, not necessarily because it's some great story, but it means their own chances get a little bit better if New Zealand are gone. Yeah, I mean, and it is, and he says as well, like, it's a little bit ugly, but it's effective. Yeah. So there's there's that, that, and we see it in all sports, it's like, oh, we don't like it, but if it works, then... Then is it, is, have you got an obligation to do? Yeah. To do like, that? I mean, if Ireland were to beat New Zealand next week, would we, would you look back at the stats and go, do you know what? There was, there was way too many rocks in that game. Yeah, <laughs> you would not. You would be jumping. There was around way too many kicks. Swinging from the rafters. But it'll be interesting because when you when you have a you know defensively strong team and a, and a team that plays in that way in terms of the pick and go, the pick and go versus the All Black style, it's sort of from a performance point of view, it kind of comes down to that who's who's going to execute then? Who's, who's mm. going to be able to impose their style on the game? And usually in those games, it, you find it's, it's a, a moment of magic from somebody when you've got that stalemate, or it's an error, a big error or a big moment of magic that can be the differentiating factor. Well, he did say there, you know, yesterday we saw signs of a perfectly, or timed, perfectly timed return to form from Sexton and Murray. And, you know, we could... I mean, God knows what you know. The last year of rugby has just been utterly unpredictable from Ireland, and I think, I think I was on here with Michael Swift and Andy Dunn. Mm. The day the before the, the Scotland the first game, day. Was this? Yeah, so yeah, the Saturday before the the Scotland game, and we were all kind of saying we don't know what Ireland will turn up tomorrow, you know. But now, you know, we have seen Murray. You know, if we're talking about this being a, a big documentary of Ireland's World Cup victory in ten years' time, they could look back to the you know Scotland, Japan. And the Samoa game where Johnny Sexton and Connie Murray just kind of clicked. And they did kind of click. The opposition wasn't great. We had a lot of possession. But some of the kicking from Murray, Earl's gathering it. Murray again, seeing space in behind. Beautiful kick. Sexton playing well. And again, that, that kind of aggression, that, that, that reaction from Sexton said a lot to me. Because when you see Johnny like that, it's good stuff. You know? After he scored the try. Yeah, was after it? he scored the try. It I mean, reminds me, Samoa. I was trying to think even when you said it a few minutes ago, one that... I knew there was some uh, some try in my head. France and the Six Nations this year. Sexton went over for a try. It was after the obviously they'd been beaten by um, beaten by England. They'd gone out performed quite poorly against Italy, mm. and they would have come in ag- into that game against France. Sexton got a try, and a pressure, yeah. there was a real passion in the celebration as yeah. well. And ultimately, it obviously didn't work out too well the following <laughs> week against against Wales. That's but the story of the year, <laughs> yeah. But when Sexton does that, I, I think I, I remember a league uh, European Cup game as well where he was in the corner and 
was it New Zealand? Well, after Stockdale's and he ran to the crowd and you know yeah. did the whole Chris Sutton kind of celebration. You don't see it often, and I think that's good. I think that's good for the, the, the an insight into the mentality. Tyke Furlong, you know, celebrating again. What a try that was! And you know that that gives me an impression that they're enjoying it and they're enjoying it off the pitch. And maybe they've blocked out a lot of this and they're coming into this game and they won't be afraid in New Zealand, which is something something that we've never said before at the World Cup. Yeah, but that mood on the pitch is contagious. When you see mm. key players and they're reacting like that and there is that bit of passion, that bit of motivation, it's it's really important. And maybe they needed opposition who gave them a little bit more space. They, they had a little bit more time to make those runs, to time everything right, to reconnect and find that little bit of rhythm again between yeah, a them. A belief, you know? like a belief that and they can oh, go geez, out next this week. This is what it feels like and, you know, just a kind of a warm-up and a build-up. Yeah. Do you remember that feeling? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Remember this, fellas, yeah. Right guys, that's where we'll leave it on the rugby for now. We'll take a quick little break and we'll be back with more from Kieran and Kleena. We'll probably go towards Tbilisi in the Irish soccer team after the break. Can't wait. Off the ball on News Talk. News Talk Breakfast. Every morning on News Talk Breakfast, we bring you the big stories of the day. But what's your take? Starting Monday, we open the phone lines and we give you the chance to have your say live on air. Well, what? Yeah, we're bringing the listeners on. We want to hear what they have to say, Shane. Good God. It's your call every morning on News Talk Breakfast. News Talk Breakfast with Shane Coleman and Kieran Cuddihy. In association with AIR. Weekday mornings at 7 on News Talk. Satisfying afternoons with Harvey Norman. First time buyer? Wondering how to get everything done? Don't. Just sit back and watch your house become a home with Harvey Norman's delivery and install. Go, Harvey, go! When it comes to family, how much do we really have in common? There's big differences, small differences, meet you in the middle kind of differences. And you debate your differences over chips and cheeseburgers or vegan cheeseburgers, which you took into at dinner or supper, or perhaps you say tea. Whatever you call it, there's no better time to come together. After all, it's differences that make a family. McCain, we are family. The eternal tiles are wood conundrum. Then again, that laminate stuff's supposed to be good. Apparently, you could march a horse through the kitchen and it wouldn't make a dent. Maybe tiles with a wood effect is the way to go. Or the other way around. The thing is, when you get your first home, you always have big plans. Whatever they are, you want to know you can get cracking as soon as you move in, which is where the Ulster Bank Mortgage Team could help. Talk to us today. We're staying out of the tiles versus wood debate, though. Ulster Bank. Help for what matters. Over 18s and residential mortgages only. Ulster Bank Ireland DAC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Simplify how your business books and pays for taxis with Link. Link Taxis offers an all-in-one priority booking service dedicated to business in Dublin. So whether you're booking from the office, heading to the airport, or caught in a downpour, let one of our professional drivers get you there. Book online, by app, or give us a call. Choose how you pay, with options to use cash, card, or business account. Get your business moving with Link. To start booking or to learn more, visit link.ie. L-Y-N-K. Ever wondered what superb sounds like? Silence. Exhale the day's toll. A seat that remembers its driver. A touchscreen entertainment system. Start the engine at the push of a button. And go. The new Skoda Superb. If it sounds this good, just imagine what it looks like. At the Plaza Group, winning national awards are always nice. Like the best motorway service station at the Barack Obama Plaza Money Gall and best forecourt facilities at the Galway Plaza. But ensuring you're a happy customer is the real prize for us. Quality fuel and forecourts, Supermax, Papa John's Pizza, Super Subs, Max Place Deli, Beauty's Coffee and Spa. The Plaza Group. Come for the fuel, stay for the food. Award winning and part of your community. Now open in Kinnegad, just two minutes from all Kinnegad exits. The B&Q 3 for 2 offer is now on, including an unmissable 3 for 2 on tiles and flooring, like real wood and laminate. So hurry to B&Q. You can do it when you 3 for 2 it. Excludes cut-to-measure flooring, flooring accessories and underlay. Every third item per single transaction in descending price order free. Offer ends November 3rd. See DIY.com. Last month, the cost you can save €309 Euro at Lidl. 
Their shop last week included delicious frozen fruit berries, only two twenty-five. Chill out with some big savings of your own. Start your big save at Lidl.ie. Lidl, more for you. The Costco can shop between August 26th and September 16th and received a gratuity for participation. Entries for the Image Businesswoman of the Year Awards 2019 close on Friday, October the 18th, and we want to hear from you. Stretching across nine categories, we're looking for entrepreneurs, CEOs, and startups. So nominate yourself, your colleague or friend on image.ie. Then join a thousand of Ireland's key influencers on Monday, November the 25th at our awards evening as we announce the winners. The Image Businesswoman of the Year Awards. Sponsored by Liffey Valley, Number 7, Samsung, BMW, Poon and Nagel, and Queen's University. Details on image.ie. Proudly supported by News Talk. Whoops, it's the annual home insurance bill and no good news as usual. Change. Beg your pardon? Change to AIG. They are providing great savings and real value. Like a new special 50% discount. That's half price. Here, give me the phone. Make the change. Visit AIG.ie or call us and see how much time and money you could save. Thank you, AIG. Normal underwriting acceptance criteria apply. Minimum premium of €210 Euro X levy supplies and optional extras not included. Applies to new AIG direct home residential customers only. Offer valid until October 31st, 2019. AIG Europe SA is authorised by the Luxembourg Ministry of Finance and supervised by the Luxembourg Commissioner for Insurance and is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland for conduct of business rules. Off the ball. This is is News Talk. All right, you're very welcome back uh, to the Sunday Paper Review. I am in the company of... Sorry there, forgot to turn on my microphone. Welcome back to the Sunday Paper Review. We are in the uh, company of Kieran Raleigh and Cleon O'Connor. We've uh, spent pretty much the majority of this so far talking about the rugby. Time, though, to turn our attentions to uh, events in Tbilisi yesterday when the Republic of Ireland drew nil all with Georgia. Um, the piece that stands out, Kieran, you think anyway... Sunday Independent, Eamon Sweeney, Kenny era just can't come soon enough, is the headline. Yeah, I think we always look at the articles maybe that might reflect our own views on it, and that's, that's <laughs> certainly been my thinking. Uh, I think I, I can understand the, you know, the crossover deal between Kenny, uh, between McCarthy and Kenny. I think the FAA wanted that, didn't want to have that pressure on Kenny to get us to a home, well, a home tournament, you know, a couple of yeah. games in the big tournament. So I can kind of understand it, even where a lot of people don't really understand it that way or wouldn't look at it that way but um, yeah he said only an imbecile could have smiled after the tedium in Tbilisi which is what the DVD will be called when it comes out I'm sure (laughs) Ireland have not been transformed under McCarthy this was the same kind of creatively impoverished performance which typified the final days of the previous incumbent and I have to say I would have rather had a John Delaney scandal today than have to talk about this game because it was awful I'd rather have watched New Zealand Italy um, even if they didn't get to run out on the pitch in Japan it was just well at least you get to see New Zealand (laughs) yeah well you get to see them train maybe or something like that but uh, there was a great line the manager is a kind of a cosplay Jack Charlton beloved by those who think it's possible to travel back to the days where we could put him under pressure give it a lash um, and I think he called him is it on the headline? Oh, it's, on, it's on the online one day. He, something about Brexit was he? Yeah I have it here actually highlighted in the it's middle Mick is the Brexit manager telling us everything can be the way it used to be before you believe yeah. it Yeah Are, are, if are we, we just very harsh it. because we have Stephen Kenny to compare him to? Is is that shining a light? Is that showing us this is what it could look like if if we didn't have like that? Like Jim comparison. Bowen going, here's what you could have won. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, is that is are we getting impatient because of that? You know, uh, I, I don't think it's helping. I don't yeah. think it's helping, Mick. And I, I, it's not even just the play. I think it's the reactions. Um, you know, I was there. I watched Kenny take Dundalk. Again, they didn't win a lot of games, but they had some incredible results in yeah. Europe and performances. More importantly, and it was how he spoke. And how he was disappointed at losing a home to Zen in St. Petersburg, who had spent millions and millions. I think mm. they had Axel Witzel in that team. Yeah. Um, they're 2 1 at home, they were 1 0 up. But Mick, uh, Mick comes out yesterday, and uh, I think Tony O'Donnell asked him, you know, are you happy with the points? And Mick gruffly says, you know, you know what do you expect me to answer to that? Of course he is, and he was thrilled. And Stephen just wouldn't be, you know. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's not just that, it's, it's the way he intends the team to play, it, it's the ambition. And you just don't see that with Mick's team. He's, he's very pragmatic and that can help you in a lot of places with a lot of teams. But at international football, all these draws, mm. like we need to win one of the last two games and they don't look very likely either, do they? Mm-hmm. Out of curiosity as well, actually, like you're saying there, Mick comes out afterwards and says, you know, pleased with the draw, good point on the road. Do you think Mick is actually pleased with the point on the road or is he just putting on the front, you know what, you know, you Inside, he might be telling the players it wasn't good enough, but he's going out to say, look, it was a hard-earned point. 
I think he seems to have lower expectations. I, th I think you're right about mm. the ambition. You know, he, he doesn't fill you with enthusiasm. And you hear, you hear that, oh, you know, the camp is happier and people get on, it's steady ship. And that's great, but you have to win. Like, it, this is international football, so it's about, yeah. it's not, it's about winning games. And I, I think that the fact that um, he is presenting that. It, it's like, he, let's play as underdogs. Mm -hmm. So if we play, that's, that's what he seems to know. We'll play as underdogs, so we'll defend with heart and it, there'll be some great individual defending. But he even admits himself that the lads didn't keep the ball very well in the middle and, you know, while they didn't get a shot at goal, we weren't great up front. Well, you have to be, you know, you, mm. that can't be okay then. That well, saying that he kept James Collins you know? on was his ability to defend. To defend, Dan McDonald yeah. Has, yeah. Dan McDonald's talking about pragmatism overtaking positivity and I think yeah. that, like if, if Mick was to bring out another biography that probably yeah. should be the name of the, <laughs> the book. Uh, like one of the reasons he kept central striker James Collins on was his ability to defend George and set pieces. I mean... But uh, if you're in a game where this is going to be crucial for our chances to qualify at some point you have to say okay, he might be the better defensive man, but we have to score. We have yeah. to be a bit more courageous yeah. and, and go for a little bit more. I'd be curious in your own role, kind of in coaching, like, would you be against kind of going out telling players like that, that, you know, on paper, the Republic of Ireland have a better team, they're considerably higher in the world rankings and stuff like that. Does it feel strange to be go out going out telling a team to to sit back and wait for an opportunity and, you know, yeah, let I, the opposition make a mistake? I I definitely think that's a strange way to, to approach it. If you are a the sign of a good team, right? If, if you're better, you should be able to impose your own game. This idea of the game is chaotic and you can't plan for anything, I think is a cop out. If, if, you're, if my team is playing another team and they're better, my team is better, I, spectators should be able to sit back and go, that's how they want to play the game. Mm -hmm. You should be able to dictate it. And I think that sometimes with the Irish soccer team, when we play teams that are deemed to be a, of lower standard than us, we sort of don't impose ourselves because we don't seem to know this is how we're going to play the game, mm. this is how we're going to attack, this is how we're going to score. There's another quote in there from, uh, <coughs> from Mick in Dan's piece. Um, and this is Mick saying, I, I always get the feeling, even from the Georgian journalists, that we should be disappointed as we are much better, but I don't get that at all. That's a ridiculous notion. So he thinks the fact that Ireland are better than Georgia is notions. Yeah. Like, uh, if this Ireland yeah. team was accused of murder, like, we'd get off because we've no fingerprints <laughs> whatsoever. Like, there's, there's just no thing that you could look at and say, that's great. Like, yeah. Vladimir Weiss says Ireland were dangerous with set pieces, which is, the, you know, the, the soft bigotry of low expectations again. Yeah. They play this football, we play another football, we play combinations, as in we pass it. Yeah. And I, I think that's just indicative. Yeah, and you could see in, like, the middle third of the pitch, Georgia... Georgia looked fantastic. They could pass the ball around comfortably. Yeah. They didn't really look like they, they were up to much at the back. They didn't really look like they were up to much once they got within 25 yards of the goal. I'd say the only people who hate Georgia-Ireland games more than Irish fans are Georgian fans. <laughs> because they play the best stuff. I, I was in, was it in Mainz years ago? It was cancelled. It wasn't allowed to be played in oh, yeah. because of the, the yeah. war. And Trapattoni is in charge. So we went to Mainz, uh, which was... Uh, Got off a little place, and they played us off the park that day. And I think yeah. we, we did we did well in the end. But you were looking at them and wondering why is it they can just play so much better? I mean, we've scored six goals in six games in a group that includes Georgia and Gibraltar. Mm. I thought there was a good line actually. In, very happy. Even back to Eamon Sweeney's piece. Mm -hmm. Even all the joking aside, which he's often quite good at. He's a very yeah. witty, witty writer. But he's talking about how I think McCarthy had highlighted. You know, Georgia got a point against Denmark at home as well. De Denmark struggled there, but. Eamon Swinney just says, the Danes tried to win in Tbilisi, Ireland hung on and hoped to nick something from a set piece. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a massive like, difference between the two games. Yeah, like. you can lose in different ways, you can win yeah. in different ways. If I mean, Ireland had, you know, had dominated Georgia yesterday and for whatever reason, they just couldn't get the ball into the back of the net, you'd yeah. probably be looking at it going, you know what, maybe it was a, you know, it was a couple of points dropped, but... You know, there's good signs heading on to Switzerland, yeah. the way the team are playing, things like that, but you're looking at this and you're going... You need to get a win against Switzerland and Denmark. There was one quote where there. Are you going to get it? There was one quote there where um, somebody asked him a question about how Georgia played with freedom, and he responded by asking the inquisitor if he ever played professional football. Mm. I mean, when you're dropping to that that low standard, I remember having a, an argument at two in the morning with a former Euro '88 hero in Prague many years ago, and I, I think I was arguing that the defeat to Cyprus that hadn't happened much longer before that. 
um, was worse than losing, or was worse than drawing to Liechtenstein. And uh, I said, at least we got a draw there. And he says, oh yeah, many medals have you won, you know. <laughs> and I think if you're going down that road, well, it's highly defensive place, are you? because yeah. Yeah. The, you don't have an answer, so you're just relying on that. But I, I don't know how. But Mick's saying that in a press conference, like that's not good. No, no, it's not. It's uh, well, you're trying to deflect, I suppose, from the reality yeah. of the situation. Tackle the man, yeah. not the ball. Yeah, yeah, studs up for that one. <laughs> All the cliches there. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot about Connolly as well. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Switzerland, go on. Sorry, I'll jump, jumping all over the place there. No, sorry, I'm just holding hold my hand there. Yeah, not pointing. <laughs> uh, Connolly's been. Uh, <laughs> It's it's almost one of those Wes stories, isn't it? Like mm. When you're not playing, you become. We always have one of them. Thirty, don't 40 we? Percent. We always have. I mean, one it's of them. good that we have one. I suppose we had Jack Byrne for a few months, and all of a sudden, everyone's on Taron Connolly now. Yeah, yeah, and Troy Parrish was in in the middle yeah. as well. Um, but Connolly did well when he came on. Uh, I, I don't think it's been harsh, but he should have scored. He yeah. had, a, a, you know, he had a great chance. He went to the wrong side of the goal. He really should have scored. And if if he did, I think we could have be getting carried away. Um, Roy well, Curtis... It would have papered over cracks, wouldn't it? Oh, no, it would have yeah. been for, for... Yeah, in general, but yeah. f- about him. Like, there's a lot well, of... That goes in. You just need one point from the last two matches. Oh, it changes everything. Mm. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, you can't criticise the lad. It's his debut and it's exactly. away from yeah. But he should have scored. And he was only on for, what, 13, 12, 13 12, minutes? Yeah. But did you yeah. see his interview afterwards? His reaction. Oh, at least the he's, game. he had the right reaction, didn't he? And the the interviewer, I can't remember who it was, but was trying to be all oh, your debut yeah. in this, and it was no, I should have scored. I'm a yeah. striker. It's my no, job like to put that, the ball yeah. in the net. Yeah, um, I like that. I like. So that. he seems to be very focused. There, there was no deflecting with him. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it was. Yeah, he wasn't taking the easy one. Took like, ownership oh, it was my first day. Will know? we knock yeah. that expectation out of him over the over the course of time? <laughs> 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 yeah, I've seen a couple of clips of him under yeah. playing underage as well, and he's got that old Damien Duff. You know the direct aggression, yeah. the good cross in, and but um, playing up front there, like he, he obviously his pace is something that we don't really have. And James Collins, I, I, my mother told me not to say anything bad if you don't have anything good to say about somebody, <laughs> so I won't say anything. But I think we might be getting a little bit carried away with um, with Connolly uh, quite quickly, which is all often the case. It's understandable a bit, but um, I'd have I'd have my issues about Mick reacting a bit testily, you know, when people yeah. say, will he be in, will he be there? And Mick seems to get ticked off that you're almost telling him how to do his job. Well, it's, it's exactly what we had towards the end of the Martin O'Neill days, wasn't it? That, you mm-hmm. know, people were questioning him about, you know, selection or about performances and stuff, that there was that bite back. And I think yeah. a lot of people are talking about how it kind of is going back towards, towards that kind of a time. Um, but is it a case as well where that kind of flashy, exciting thing that 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 Connolly brought the other night again it serves as a comparison to the dreary can't keep the ball type performances that we see when he's not on the pitch mm. you know so it nearly calls out the thing that we're it, missing it, all the time it shows you know? it shows it up a bit too much for Mick I yeah, think so yeah uncomfortable who was who was on the RT panel do you remember it was Duff Kevin Doyle and it was Doyle it was Doyle <coughs> yeah Doyle said you know the more the more you guys call for somebody to come in the, the less the, the Mick less will chance. want them, yeah, which yeah. I, it was tongue in cheek. But as somebody who's played at Wolves under Mick, it didn't yeah. it didn't come across great for the manager. Um, yeah, and I think um, even on the TV coverage, the uh, I think it was Shane McGrath had a decent piece in the Mail, kind of con- comparing the the rugby and the football analysis. And oh yeah, yeah, he's kind of saying what frequently distinguishes Irish soccer on big days is where na- is analysis on RT. Whereas too much of the contributions of Jamie Heaslip in particular, but also Stephen Ferris on the Rugby World Cup seem compromised by the fact that many of the men there scrutinising were teammates and friends. There's a more freedom in the rebooted soccer studio since the departure of the old regime where challenging the orthodoxy had succumbed to crankiness and headline chasing long before its end. Coverage of the national team has been less hysterical but still thorough over the last while. And I think Damien Duff was talking about it well yesterday after the game as well, about, you know, the the expectation of going over there to play for a draw and, you know, how how wrong it seems. Yeah, I'd like to see Damien uh, speaking forthrightly now. I think a few of us journalists met him before Euro 2016, before going over to France, and it was his first time to get into that world. Mm. And he said, um, openly, he said, like, I'm not going to, criticise Robbie or yeah. somebody else because they're my mates and we went through X and Y for years um, but now as you said it's kind of rebooted so there's younger players coming in people he doesn't know and he's not afraid to, to give that straight forward answer mm. which is great to see because some people can be a bit 
restricted or constricted by well, friendships. There's, there's a it's sense a of loyalty job. there as well. Yeah, yeah, you know, if you're just out of a camp and then you've got to sit behind a desk. And, and for sports people, you know, when you're in the arena, the, you're like, well, what, what do they know out there? I'm the one yeah. here. So you with, when you're on the flip side, it can be hard to, to do it as well. Um, but I think the best coverage is, is that bit more objective, bit more realistic sense of it, which we are getting a bit more from the soccer now. Uh, sure. Roy, Roy Curtis has a good piece on Connolly as well. Uh, I, I feel it's probably a little overly optimistic and you know exciting about somebody who's only played a couple of games, but he, he's, he's laid it out like strong and hard that he should be involved a bit more. Um, he says, if his omission falls slightly short of a scandal, it was another depressing example of the inherent and suffocating conservatism under which Irish football prefers to operate. McCarthy was celebrating a point one in his post-match interviews, but he was railing against the consensus. And I think I've seen a lot of reactions. Some people were saying, they'd, some, pe- some fans on Twitter saying they'd give up an Irish team being at the Euros to have a team by Kenny... Mm. I, know, I think that's a bit too far myself um, and we're forgetting the FBI need money as well that's kind of would be handy um, but Kenny's team's playing well <coughs> looking good I mean the, their game against Italy I didn't see it all but they they like they just go out with that confidence I mean if you if you remember his, his Dundalk teams you, they were just nice to watch because yeah. they mm. try you know as you were saying as well earlier on Selena, when we started the football chat you were kind of saying is you know the frustration around Mick McCarthy the fact that we know Stephen Kenny is coming in in a year, in a year, a bit time, it could be in six months' time, depending on what happens over the yeah. qualifying campaign. But is it also down to the fact that on Thursday night, the under 21s go out and play against Italy? And granted, it was a nil all draw, just like yesterday in Tbilisi, but they played well. They, they, they took yeah. them on, you know? Yeah, they played well, and the talk afterwards, it wasn't, oh, we were great. You know, there, there wasn't, there's an ambition. You can feel it off them. Yeah. You can see it on the pitch. You can see it in how they play. It's exciting. Mm-hmm. And Obviously, as spectators, that's what you want, and it seems that it's bringing the best out of players. And I think when you feel like your national team is settling, or we'll, we'll just go there and we'll do our best and we'll defend and, and we'll hope to nick something at the end, like that's not really, that doesn't inspire great confidence in you or inspire any sort of, I suppose, enthusiasm mm-hmm. about the sport. So I think Kenny seems to be bringing up exciting young players and also he's enthusiastic and he's drawn the best out of the spectators as well and bringing a bit of energy to Irish football well, so why wouldn't you want that? I think, you know? I think those young players will be much more enthused to play the style of game that Kenny wants to play yeah. like that's his philosophy you know earlier on talking about fingerprints like Kenny has that way he wants to play and he gets them to win as well he gets yeah. teams to win he's had a couple of slip ups early on like Dunfermline didn't go so well but he did well and he got to a, a couple of cup finals over in Scotland didn't do so well in the league but he has that ability to get them to play above themselves mm. um, I, I was lucky enough to be at I don't know if you remember Derry City Gretna which doesn't stand out as oh, one of yeah. the all time European you know I don't remember that, that fixture but I remember Gretna like as you remember Gretna yeah, yeah. well one of his fa- the his, quick rise his, and quick fall yeah well his great quote afterwards they beat them 5-1 in Scotland um, and it was just a stunning game of football amazing goals and he came in afterwards and said uh, you know to the Scottish journalist said, you all like to think of Gretna as the fairy tale, but we're the real fairy tale. <laughs> and they went to Stade de France, oh, no, Parc de France, and um, I think they drew at home with PSG, you know, a good mm, side. Yeah. And the other results he's gotten since coming back, taking Dundalk from where he did. I mean, there's so much there to show a coach who's working, obviously you can sign players, but a coach who's working with a lot less than most have, and he's gotten them playing good football, ambitious football. Fans love it. You know, obviously not, maybe not everywhere, but... Um, <coughs> the optimism there is that you can get somebody here who, who's willing to work with players and make them better and create a structure and a style that will be enjoyable for the players and the fans and that's yeah. something we just haven't had I mean I was I was there through all the Trapattoni games for my sins I don't know what I did in a previous life but this is it's just it's something to be a lot more but it excited is like about. a breath of fresh air really oh, you know, utterly it's, yeah. it is more enjoyable he's not even here yet he must be loving this yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe right. lose 4 nil to Austria in the opening game or something yeah. right we are running out of time quite quickly where do we want to go before we finish up the marathon maybe yeah Elliot Kipchoge where are we? Yeah, breaking well, the two hour I mean it's you can look at it two ways two hour marathon it's his second time of, of trying it and, and does it the other day good debate around the, the science versus the sport all the, the different pacing that was used you know so they had a, a car in front of them with a laser to, to show the pacemakers exactly where to run you've got new Nike shoes some people are calling them um, 
you know, legal doping because they did knock, I think, 4% or 4% mm. improvement that, yeah, on it. Yeah, that's what some are arguing, yeah. So, I mean, it's a massive achievement. The way he pr he is presenting it is, is you know, showing people that, that limits... Um, Limits can be broken, and the the power of the human spirit. It and did all get that. a bit, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know, wanted to bring peace to the world and stuff. I'm yeah. not sure how running the marathon in under yeah. two hours brings peace to the world, but you know, for Clayton, you did it. It, 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 it did that. just yeah. feel at yeah. the same time like it basically was this massive advertisement for Nike. And Ineos. And Ineos as well, yeah. And, like, and there's a good piece in the Sunday Times, uh, John Goodbody, on page 11, just details, mm. as you mentioned, how all these factors were set yeah. up for him to break the two hours. So he says, um, Vienna was chosen because when an athlete is running at 13 miles an hour, the body temperature goes up, so it was necessary to have a place where the air temperature was around 10 degrees Celsius. The weather in Vienna, with less chance in October of rain and wind, was important. They, um, uh, they chose it as well because... Uh, it was only, I think, an hour behind <coughs> Kipchoge's his natural, bo yeah, his natural yeah. body body clock yeah. and stuff like that. Like talking about logistics. The pacemakers, the shoes. Yeah. So uh, they have uh, a pair of Nike shoes called the Zoom X Vaporfly Next Percentage, believed to provide a 4% energy saving. Anyone thinking of buying them for their morning jog can expect to pay nearly £300 for the privilege. Yeah. Which isn't wildly crazy when you think of something probably football, isn't football boots, <laughs> yeah, you know, football boots probably but, it, but if it again I, I i do think it's 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 a tough one to quantify really yes it proves <laughs> what it proves that somebody can do that and if anybody goes into a treadmill today or tomorrow morning stick it at 21 kilometers an hour yeah and see how long you last <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what he's basically even with done. your shoes yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what he's done for two hours which is yeah. ridiculous like how, how long do you reckon you could do Oh God! Are you on kilometers an hour? Oh, I've no idea. I wouldn't embarrass myself to get suggest. a thirty seconds. I'm talking yeah. seconds anyway. Yeah. For me, yeah, 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 yeah. maybe seconds single digit seconds, seconds. which yeah. is insane. Like it's it's, it's ridiculous. Um, but uh, another interesting thing was that um, it reminded me that Roger Bannister, when he did his first four minute mile, yeah. he had pace setters as well, mm. which people probably forget because it was <laughs> over yeah. four minutes. Yeah. I don't know were they hundred meter runners each one, but. Uh, uh, just a nice mention maybe to finish off if you're down in Nina in Tipperary um, there's a statue of Johnny Hayes there and when they were walking through the, the history of the marathon it brought, brought us back to 1908 uh, the Olympic marathon in um, London and he did it in 2 hours 55 now he was born to Irish parents he was running for America in the Irish American Athletic Club there but he did 2 hours 55 and we're now looking at under 2 hours which is just frankly ridiculous mm. and you, you wonder you know what you know? You're gonna have to wear something like Oscar Pistorius's um, blades, yeah. blades to to get much further than this. But I don't quite know what it means. There are a lot of people who are a bit uncomfortable that it is basically a giant Nike ad, especially coming in the week that the Nike Oregon yeah, project I mean, asked, is shut down. Yeah, it's, was it planned? Well, it's well timed, and yeah. it, it, even from an athletics point of view, is it well timed or badly timed? Well. I think well, it changes it's, the conversation a little bit, a lot, you know, it's, it's, it yeah. moves your attention a little bit and you get to talk about sports science and athletics and, and the things that are supposed to be good about athletics, this kind of human spirit and a human endurance mm -hmm. and all that, so it does move a little bit to there. Um, but it, it kind of, it's, it's kind of tapping into the wider cynicism around sport and, you know, it's more of a philosophical topic that... You know, we're 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 not enjoying soccer as much. A lot of people mm. are as as we used to mm. because of this overemphasis on on sports science and uh, developments. And I mean, it's no surprise Mark Brailsford was involved in that, Mr. Mm. Marginal Gains, or Dave um, Brailsford, or David Brailsford. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Mark. Whoever. Sir you Dave are. Brailsford, actually, <laughs> Kieran. This is the, the Republic. Uh, the yeah. Republic now. But all the, a lot of the little details. You know how how they formulated the um, the pattern of the the pacemakers. Uh, pace setters, <laughs> pacemaker. They are pacemakers. Sorry, I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was a lot of that little detail, and I, I, I think a lot of people are finding. And you work in this area, but a lot of people feel there's a lot of the, the love or the romance of, of sport and how to get a, a, a an improvement over somebody else or an edge here. It's almost becoming overkill, you know. Th like there is so much science around sport, and and as a I suppose as a field of academia, it has exploded over mm. the last couple of years, which is wonderful for people like me who work in it. You know, you're, yeah, yeah. people want to know all these stuff. But when you think about the, what's really good about sport and that competition piece, it we always love that human spirit. You talk about Johnny Sexton and doing his, mm. his roar Japan after... this morning. Japan. I was just going to tie it all that's, back, yeah. That's yeah. the bit that we find fascinating. That's the bit that brings out the passion. And I suppose the art of, for, for a coaching staff is to provide all the, the good sports science structure, 
but allow that passion and, and human element to be expressed within it. You know, that that's the magic if you can balance those two pieces. We're, we're, we're probably going to find a book in about five years that says Japan was doing something they shouldn't have been doing or, <laughs> yeah, or explain yeah, it away yeah, yeah, yeah. in some other scientific way that we're not... Well, really you know, they're able to choose, even small things, they're able to choose the, the layout of the games they wanted in the, the pool, you know, when they were playing each team, things like that. Yeah, they're you know. yeah, minor things that Tier 2 nations have always been yeah. denied, I suppose. But at so. the same time, yeah, exactly, they've had to overcome the stuff that... Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter when they were allowed to play Ireland or when they were allowed to play Scotland. Yeah, yeah. They hadn't really beaten them in World Cups and significant games And, and they shouldn't be. Yeah. They shouldn't be. But I think, um, to, to, to kind of tie it all back up again around the rugby, um, it would be wonderful now. I mean, this is like we've, you know, when coaches say we've signed a new player, it's like we found a new team, you know, at the elite level yeah. of sport. And they play this wonderful, like they're, they're, they're almost like a Brazil of rugby at this stage. I mean, to, to pull off those results, like it's, they used to maybe play that way but not get where they wanted. Um, but to, to do that and to win and to get through and top the pool, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a dream for them. And it's, it's probably, you know, if we're talking about Nike having a bad week and finishing off with something positive, I think this has finished off the Rugby World Cup's bad week with something positive. Um, it, what they do next week against South Africa, I think they lost 41-7. Just yeah, just, just a couple before. of weeks before the tournament started. Yeah, like you had Mampimpi and Colbe, but Mampimpi and Colbe on the wings for them, Matsushima and Fukuoka for, for the Japanese, like Faf de Klerk and Nagari, the scrum halves are brilliant to watch. It's going to be a fabulous, uh, it's going to be a fabulous weekend. We looked at the four games. Yeah, unbelievable. I can't wait for England, Australia. Like, yeah. Czech and Czech and Eddie Jones already well, Thursday, close to at each other's throats. After Thursday will be good just with the two of them press conference. Exactly, yeah. And so that's Saturday morning, then the Ireland game, and then two fabulous games on Sunday. Like, I mean, it's a shame we're talking about it, all the other stuff we're talking about, really, when you look at you know how well a lot of the Rugby World Cup has gone, mm. and that weekend. Um, it's good to see. I, I think it's happened in every World Cup that somebody from outside the top eight has gotten to the quarterfinal. Mm. So it's great that Japan have continued that. Yeah. I think Scotland were normally the team, or Western Samoa, who broke through. I think Scotland were like 10th in about three World Cups, and they got through to the quarterfinal against the, you know, the pattern, the, the yeah. rankings. So it's great that Japan did it, um, but they've merited it. That's that's the best thing of all, isn't it? When somebody merits it, plays yeah. that way, they, they're not they didn't lucky. Need any, you yeah. know, yeah. it's it's they've they've earned and and displayed that they are capable of of beating good teams and producing good performances. Yeah, so. the exact opposite of the Irish soccer team, basically. <laughs> <laughs> that's where I leave it. Cleaner, uh, Kieran, thanks a million for joining us uh, this afternoon on the Sunday pay per view. That's where we leave it for uh, for today. We'll be back with the Sunday pay per view next weekend at the same time when. I expect we're going to be either reviewing a fantastic Irish win in a World Cup quarterfinal for the first time ever or we're looking, looking at back at another gallant defeat I think we're in the last days of the we're, we're looking at a final rematch against Japan. It's all to the stars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's that optimism. Oh, you need to talk to Mick McCarthy. <laughs> 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 guys, tell me that, yeah. guys, thanks a million. We'll uh, be looking back at the rugby with Brian O'Driscoll and Mike Ross after the break. Off the ball on News Talk. Listen up, class. Aldi's Play Rugby sticker promotion is finishing soon. Keep collecting official Irish rugby stickers every time you spend €30 Euro in Aldi. Fill your primary school's poster for a chance to win one of two 